Hi, this is example calculation for a toroid inductor. So I should start out with a description of a toroid. In case you haven't seen it before, this is what a toroid looks like. So a toroid would have a cross section. So it can have any cross section. But for this example, I'm going to imagine a toroid with a rectangular cross section. This is the sketch of the rectangular cross section and the way to make a toroid would be to revolve it around an axis. So revolve um, around an axis, um, vertical axis here. So, so this is a toroid. And when we talk about toroid, this is the three-dimensional object that I want you to visualize. And for the inductor or inductance calculation, you have to imagine a wire that's wrapped around this toroid um, in the way that I'm just going to draw right now. So for our example calculation, imagine a toroid with a rectangular cross section that you just saw before. Let me finish this sketch with the full uh, perspective drawing of this uh, three-dimensional object. This is the inner diameter, and this is the outer diameter. There's the same cross section on the right hand side as there was in the uh, left hand side. Let me give me some uh, parameters of this uh, toroid. So the toroid has so the toroid has a height h, and let me specify. Uh, the width this way. I'll give the inner radius R1 and the outer radius R2. And to finish specifying the toroid, I have to tell you how the wire is wrapped around this geometric object. Um, so this is how the wire is wrapped around. Let me draw a few representative uh, wires. So let's say starting from here, it goes radially outward and then wraps downward along the bottom surface it wraps back and comes up in along the inner diameter comes out radially again wraps down and then goes back along the bottom surface comes back up and then comes out and so on um, it's gonna get quite tedious uh, drawing all of this so you have to imagine this uh, wrapping around to continue uh, around the entire toroid. So I won't um, throw the whole thing here. So this is the perspective view. Let me draw one more view that will help us describe this toroid more accurately. That would be the top view. That is, going back to the toroid that we drew before, Imagine that we are looking at the top surface here. So this is the top view of the toroid. So these two circles represent the inner and outer radius of the toroid. Let me draw something to illustrate the wires. So here I have drawn 29 circles representing 29 wires coming out of the board. Uh, let me draw the symbols for that, wires coming out of the board. But of course, these don't have to be 29. It can be really N number of wires. So N, capital N, represents the number of times the wire is wrapped around. Let me finish drawing this representation of the wires in the top view. All right, excuse my drawing and <laughs> imagine that these are uniformly wrapped around. So the wire comes out of the board, radially goes out, and on the outside radius, it goes into the board again. And I'm not drawing here the return wire on the other side, along the bottom of the toroid. Okay, let me finish the drawing here. I have to indicate the direction of the wire. Well, I don't have to, I want to. All going into the board. All right. 
So this is the question we are trying to answer in this example calculation. What is the inductance? So let's just start out with the definition. This is how inductance was defined as we covered Faraday's law and inductors. The way inductance L is defined is through this defining relationship that the induced voltage is equal to the inductance L times rate of change of current. This the voltage, remember, is going to come from Faraday's law, which says that the induced voltage is equal to minus rate of change of the magnetic flux. So what that means is we are going to need the magnetic field to calculate the magnetic flux. So this is a good example calculation because it has many parts. To complete this calculation from beginning to end requires that you really understand everything about magnetism thoroughly. That's why I want you to show this calculation to you in detail in video format so that you can watch it on your own time rewatch any of the parts you need to, or skip the parts that you feel like you understand it pretty well. So I'm going to break up this problem into two parts. The first part is where we are going to calculate the magnetic field. So we'll calculate the magnetic field as a function of distance from the center of the toroid. And this will be an Ampere's law question. If you feel like you understood that part well, when we went through it, then you can skip ahead, skip ahead to the part where we've already found the magnetic field. Now we are using that to try to calculate the inductance. Um, if you feel like you need a review of application of Ampere's law, then please watch on. And the second part of the question is that once we have an expression for the magnetic field, then we are going to calculate the magnetic flux which can be expressed as the area integral of B dot dA. And you'll find that once we find the magnetic flux, then it's an easy step from there to finish up this portion of Faraday's law to say that the rate of change of magnetic flux is equal to induced voltage and see if we can factor up di dt and call the remaining constant term the inductance. All right, so let's uh, sketch out the steps for doing part one, finding out the magnetic field. So we have to use Ampere's law, meaning we have to look at this geometry and exploit any symmetry that we see to help us find the magnetic field magnitude of magnetic field from the Ampere's law. Let me remind you what Ampere's law says. Ampere's law says that the line integral of magnetic field B dot DL around the closed loop is equal to mu naught times the amount of current enclosed. So just like with application of Gauss's law, you need to have a sense of the direction of magnetic field and the symmetry that you can use so that you can one, work out this dot product here, and two, so that you can come up with an Amperian loop, a path along which you will calculate this line integral where from your sense of the direction of magnetic field, you can say what the dot product is. Normally you want the direction between B and DL to be either 90 degrees or zero degrees so that this dot product works out nicely. And you want to be able to use a symmetry argument to say that the magnitude of magnetic field isn't changing. So you can pull it outside the integral and you can complete the rest without actually knowing what the field is. So, all right, so let's just start out with the one direction of the magnetic field. So we look at this toroid 
and we are going to think about the direction of magnetic field inside all these loops that are wrapping around the toroid. So this is where it's useful to have a sense of direction for the magnetic field due to a loop of current. Let me imagine this loop here that's lying along the, uh, well, the plane of the board. So um, using my right hand, this is the version of the shortcut rule I'm using. I'm using the shortcut rule for the loop of current and I orient my right hand so that my fingers curl around in the direction of the loop. Then as, the, as my fingers curl around in the direction of the loop, left to right on the bottom, up along the inner diameter, and then right to left along the top, then the direction of my thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field that's generated by that loop of current. So for this loop outlined here, the right hand rule says that the magnetic field is coming out of the board. Magnetic field is coming out of the board here, going into the board here. So let me draw just one loop for representation of the magnetic field in the top view. Magnetic field will go along this circular uh, field line. Um, imagine it's a perfect circle. Um, on the left side, it'll be coming towards me out of the plane. And then on the right side, it'll be going away from me into the plane. So that's the magnetic field line. And um, I drew just the one circle. But if you drew more complete field line, then there will be, it'll be a series of concentric circles. Now, toroid geometry has really one symmetry here. And the symmetry is the rotational symmetry. As you take the toroid, and when you rotate it about the center of the toroid, or more precisely, about an axis that's going to, through the center, let's say out of the plane, or you know into the plane, doesn't matter, it's an axis. So as you rotate this toroid about that axis, uh, nothing changes. Um, if you imagine it's a uniformly wrapped around, excuse my drawing again, then if you rotate it 90 degrees, or if you rotate it by any amount of angle, then nothing in the toroid changes. What that means, we can make this argument. So given this circle of radius r, mm, let me use the letter capital R, Given this circle of radius r, we can say that the magnetic field can be expressed as a function of this radius r alone. No dependence on angle because of this rotational symmetry. If you have magnetic field at this point, the magnitude of the magnetic field should be the same all the way around this circle because you can rotate this geometry by any amount of angle and nothing would change. So that's our setup. Now, understanding all of that, to finally apply Ampere's law, we have to define an Amperean loop. It's going to be a path that exploits all this symmetry that has been pointed out. So uh, let me pick this circular path. So let's say we want to find the magnetic field at this point, which is at a distance r from the center of the toroid. Then what we would do is we would define our Amperian loop as a circle that goes through this point. So it would look something like this. And we need to assign a sense of direction, let's say, if we are looking at DL at this point here, let's say it goes along the same direction as the direction of the magnetic field. Then um, our expressions have no unnecessary negative sign. So with this Amperian loop that I defined, this is what we can say about Ampere's law. We can say that the left-hand side becomes the line integral of B dot DL, but magnetic field B and the 
path element DL, they go in the same direction. So this dot product simply becomes the magnitude B times the path length of path element DL. So in addition, so since this path is a circular path, we can say that based on the rotational symmetry we pointed out, that the magnitude of magnetic field is actually constant along that path. So we can pull the magnetic field outside of the integral. And we can say this is equal to magnetic field times the line integral DL. But this is a very simple expression. That's simply the, the path length of the circle. I feel like I know a circumference of a circle. So this should be equal to the magnetic field strength times the circumference of the circle of radius r, 2 pi r. Now, based on Ampere's law, this should be equal to the constant mu naught times current enclosed. And this current enclosed deserves a little bit more thought than usual. So by current enclosed, we mean how much current is poking through the area that is bounded by the Amperian loop. Well, these are the currents that are poking through that um, area bounded by Ampere's loop. So each wire carries current I, so that means there's N times I amount of current enclosed. So the right hand side is equal to mu naught N I. All right, let's solve this for magnetic field. So magnetic field is as a function of radius r equal to mu naught and i divided by 2 pi r. If this reminds you of the formula for the magnetic field that you derived for line current, that's fine. It actually is pretty similar. The only difference is that there's this n. Um, I don't know if I would draw any uh, deeper connection beyond that, but um, it, it looks similar. And um, all the steps we did are correct. So, all right. So we found the magnetic field as a function of R. Now, one thing I do want to note is that it is a function of R. It's not uniform magnetic field over this cross-sectional area. And that's the part that's going to make our next calculation a little bit more complicated. So, well, let's move on. <laughs> All right, we found the magnetic field inside the toroid, and that is equal to mu naught n i divided by 2 pi r. So this r, it has a range. The minimum radius r is r1. Uh, less than that, you are outside the toroid, so all the calculation is different. And the maximum radius is outside radius, R2. Outside of that, once again, the enclosed current becomes very different. So we remain within this bounds to be inside a toroid. So for the second step, in trying to find the inductance of this inductor, is we have to come up with an analytical expression for the magnetic flux. Now, with the solenoid example, we simply said that magnetic flux is equal to magnetic field times area. That does not work here. That's because the magnetic field depends on the distance from the center of the toroid. So this um, old expression does not work we have to fall back on the integral-based definition of magnetic flux. That the small contribution to magnetic flux is the magnetic field times the area element, dA. And we have to integrate this over the, the surface that we are considering. In our case, I want you to imagine this surface here the cross-sectional area, the rectangular surface here. So 
All right, I guess let's write it out. So the magnetic field is coming out of the board here. Let's say dA also comes out of the board. So this B dot dA would be simply B dA. Now, it's an area integral, so it's going to involve a double integral here. Let's try to parameterize this integral in a convenient way. I think the most convenient way to do it would be um, uh, using this axis here along the x direction and y direction. So the integral would be in terms of the area element dx dy. And we have to specify the integral. The x integral goes from x is equal to r1, the inner radius, to x is equal to r2, the outer radius. And the y integral would go from y is equal to 0. Uh, let's say that's at the bottom of the toroid to the full height of h. All right, so that's the integral there. And our magnetic field would be a function of x because x represents the distance from the center of the toroid out to whichever point we are looking at. Okay, so let's write it out. This is equal to the magnetic field in terms of x, mu naught, and i over 2 pi x integrated in terms of x and y with the x going from r1 to r2 and the y going from 0 to h. Seems like an easy enough integral. Notice that nothing here actually depends on y. So the y integral simply becomes multiplication by h. Now, there's something that does depend on x. So 1 over x. So the antiderivative will be natural log. So let me write this out. So factoring out all the constants um, and doing the dy integral, it's equal to mu naught times n i over 2 pi times the h that's coming from the y integral. And I'm now writing down the integral for 1 over x integrated with respect to x. So that would be the natural log of x evaluated from x equals r1 to r2. So writing it all out, this becomes mu naught and i h over 2 pi times natural log of r2 over r1. I skipped one step involving the logarithm algebra. So the skip step I skipped is writing down natural log of r2 minus natural log of r1. Doing logarithm algebra, that becomes natural log of r2 over r1. All right. Now, when you look at this carefully, um, I hope you realize that we are missing something here. It's a, really a common mistake to make. I make this all the time. <laughs> so this magnetic flux that we just calculated is magnetic flux through a single loop. It's magnetic flux through a single loop here. So let me write that out before I forget. So this is magnetic flux through a single loop. This toroid has n loops total. And each time this wire wraps around, there's this much magnetic flux going through the additional loop. So when there's n loop, the total magnetic flux will be this single loop magnetic flux times n. So the total magnetic flux is mu naught times n squared and the rest of the expression. All right.
That's the magnetic flux. It does require careful calculation, but it's not that complicated. It's doable. That's why I like this illustration, because it's not, you know, simple, trivial expression that you might guess. It does take work, but it's a doable work. So now we are going to use this expression for magnetic flux to figure out an expression for induced voltage and from that calculate the inductance of this toroid. All right, so we have the magnetic flux. This is the total magnetic flux, as you can see in this n squared. So the induced voltage around the whole toroid, uh, imagine the, all those n loops, will be equal to minus rate of change of magnetic flux. But for the purpose of the calculation of inductance, let me not worry about all these minus signs. So I'll just say, I only care about the magnitude. I'm not gonna worry about the minus sign. So let me take the deriv time derivative here. When you look at the expression for the magnetic flux, it looks like everything here is constant with respect to time, except for possibly one. The current might be a function of time. So let me write this out. All the constant times the rate of change of current. So this is the form of the expression that we are looking for. So this boxed term here is the inductance of the toroid. And you can see here that nothing here depends on any dynamic quantity. That it depends on the physical constant and the geometric parameters. Oops, speaking of geometric parameters, I forgot about this height, h. No. Let me put it in here. This thing times h. <laughs> I copied it wrong. Um, all right, so let me write down what the inductance of toroid is. So remember all these parameters that we use to specify the toroid the inner and the outer radius, height of the toroid, and the number of turns n. So in terms of all those quantities, the inductance of toroid is given by mu naught n squared times h times natural log of r2 over r1 divided by 2 pi. So that's it. That's the example calculation for inductance of toroid. There are, there can be more complicated geometries, but in this class, we won't really worry about them. All the models of toroid that you might possibly deal with in this lower division <laughs> electromagnetic class is the solenoid, you have seen that calculation, it's a lot simpler, and the toroid. This is really as complicated as inductance calculation is going to get. Um, all right, so that's everything I have. Um, until next time, bye.